Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, Mr. Gentleman. <laughs> Mr. Gentleman, <laughs> it's been a long day. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's Mr. O'Brien. And today's lecture, our short little lecture, is going to be on the American subs during World War II. Very interesting story. First of all, the Americans called their submarines pig boats. Try to imagine up to 50 men in a submarine with two bathrooms. Incredibly hot. It smelt like beyond description because there were tons of things that were chemical, including monstrous batteries, diesel fuel, electricity, generators, right? and quite frankly, uh, I must tell you that, you know, taking a shower, that didn't exist. And the bathroom situation, well, sometimes you just urinate into a can and it went right into the bilge pump. So you had to be a very special type of person to be in the submarine service, the silent service. You could spend weeks at sea, right? Only time you knew it was night, unless you came up on the deck, which was rare, was if uh, the red light was on. So psychologically speaking, to be in the submarines, you had to be a very special individual. You know, America, uh, you know, quite frankly, we're a little bit behind the curve, but in the beginning of the war, after the Japanese did not hit the submarine bases at Pearl Harbor, Nagamo made a really big mistake about this, we were behind the Germans. The Germans had perfected underwater boats, U-boats, as early as World War I in the early 1900s, about 1916 and all the way up to about 1918, and they were very good. And during World War II, thank God, Adolf Hitler ignored the Kriegmarine, the Navy, and did not build the 500 U-boats they hoped to get. As a matter of fact, when the war broke out in 1939, I believe they had less than 40, right? And there's an American sub on the right, and that's a German U-boat in the Atlantic waters on the left. So, we're going to have to do some catching up, and we will. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here, men, is that the United States never advertised about the fact that we practice unrestricted submarine warfare. As a country of rules and trying to obey all the conventions of war, traditionally you must be very careful not to torpedo innocent ships. You know, ships that are not carrying war materials hospital ships, ships carrying prisoners, ships carrying, you know, baby food, for God's sake. So we're going to very quietly, we never told the media about this, from the very beginning at the end of Pearl Harbor in December 41, we we're going to practice unrestricted submarine warfare. If you're flying a Japanese flag or even suspicion of being a Japanese ship, your orders are to sink it. Don't worry about giving a warning. Don't worry about sending out lifeboats. Your job is to scrap the Japanese fleet so they cannot feed their soldiers on the islands all through the Southwest Pacific. Now, this is obviously a propaganda picture, and you can see by the flags painted on the deck there on the conning tower, the number of ships that they've sunk. But it's not an exaggeration to say that's Mount Fujiyama, Mount Fuji. Yes, the Americans are very daring, going right into Tokyo Harbor, they're going after their cargo ships and their fuel ships. Men, you know, it's more glamorous to sink a battleship or a carrier, but it's the cargo ships that carry the food. So we're trying to starve the Japanese out of the war, just the way Hitler tried to starve England out of the war during the Battle of the Atlantic. So remember, we're only talking about American ships, we're not talking about ships from other countries. So we're really going to put the hurt on these guys. Now, how did Japanese subs do? Well, men, you know, they brought in those mini subs uh, during Pearl Harbor days, and uh, the five mini subs failed. But here's the thing. The Japanese had a very, very good fleet of submarines, but they didn't use them for the right purpose. They thought they should be... Uh, you know, supply ships, uh, reconnaissance, dropping off spies, stuff like that. And you can look at this photograph here. Look at this very carefully. It is an airplane being launched, a seaplane being launched in the middle of the Pacific. And quite frankly, uh, it's interesting because they want to do reconnaissance with their subs. 
they, they, they should have been more aggressive, but they didn't see their submarines as an offensive weapon like we did. They saw it as an auxiliary service to the surface fleet for Yamamoto and Nagamo. Now, there's the famous Mark 24 torpedo. Men, God, in the beginning of the war, when we first started out, these torpedoes were horrible. I don't know the failure rate, but you fire a torpedo and it goes off course. It doesn't sound right. It goes into the mud and shallow water. You know, it misses the ship completely or it hits the ship and doesn't detonate. I think it was the USS Tang. Don't quote me. Uh, it may have been the swordfish. I don't know. My memory doesn't serve me. But we actually had American subs in the early part of the war that were sunk by their own torpedoes. How the heck does that happen? How does the torpedo circle around and come back and get you? Now, there's a learning curve here, men. And, you know, slowly but surely we're going to get there. But in the beginning, our captains of these submarines were a little bit nervous because they were very, very afraid of the Japanese depth charges and the Japanese heavy cruisers. And, you know, it's going to take us a while to catch up, get our courage up. And, you know, really, seriously, quite frankly, you have an excellent chance of getting killed in the service. So just getting in the submarine proves your bravery. But being out there for four to six weeks, that's ah, unbelievable. Now, as we talked about the Mark 14 torpedo, when the war began, we only had 28 subs. And let me tell you what, those submarines were pretty antiquated. And firing a torpedo is an exact science. Because if it comes up too high, it porpoises. And if you go down too low, it just falls apart. I mean, it goes right into the mud. Okay. Now, take a look at this. Read this for a second, if you will. Yeah. There it is, gentlemen. Unrestricted submarine warfare. We're supposed to be the good guys. You know, search the ships before, make sure there's no innocent people on it, make sure it's not something that's not going to the war effort. But men, we can't play by the rules anymore. Every time we stop and try to get these guys 10 or 15 minutes to go off the ship and drop their lifeboats, they could SOS a Japanese destroyer, and those destroyers would be right on top of us dropping those depth charges. There's a great uh, YouTube video. I want you to check, take a look at it a little bit later. But remember, we're only going to do 15 minutes on these presentations, so that will make me run over. Well, if you get a chance, take a quick look at it. I think you'll like it. And this is an actual photograph of a Japanese destroyer going to the bottom of the ocean. Men, two-thirds of their fleet, and uh, two-thirds of their tankers, and 50% of their fleet didn't make it. They're starving. They're absolutely starving. Some people argue that the atomic bombs are not necessary, that the submarines were doing the job and that the Japanese were ready to quit long before August 6, 1945, when Hiroshima found itself in the crosshairs. All right, and here's another thing we talked about earlier, the code breakers. Man, the code breakers were really, really something else because they really gave us the ability to read the Japanese mail, and it was pretty accurate. The tonnage we were sinking was ridiculous. And these cargo ships, unless they're escorted by destroyers, they have no way to protect themselves. Men, you know, when the Japanese start getting American airplanes flying over the South Island of Honshu and Kyushu and stuff like this, they strafe these airfields and the airplanes wouldn't even blow up because they didn't have any fuel. Yes, the fuel from the colonies was not reaching the homeland and a Stugi airfield here. These bombers and fighter planes have no gas. Hey, you have the best fighter in the world, but you got to have gas to make it go. And, you know, men, there were some accidents. Unfortunately, the Japanese used a lot of slave labor, and they used a lot of immigrants who did not believe in the idea of Japan's supremacy and the code prosperity sphere. And, you know, quite frankly, we did torpedo some hell ships. Those are ships that have either slaves or American prisoners of war. Men, we may have accidentally, tragically, killed 21,000 Allied prisoners of war. You know what? It happens. You know, war is a 
unsure, dirty business. And in every single war, even today, friendly fire is a factor and it just cannot be avoided. The fog of war. Men, I mean, you may not know this, but California actually came under attack. In 1942, the Japanese shelled the coast of California. And this is the first time we've been attacked since the War of 1812. In a later lecture, we'll learn how the Japanese used hot air balloons, unmanned, to drop incendiaries into the great forest of the northwest of California and Oregon. And there were some casualties. So if you get a chance, please go back and check uh, the YouTube video here. And uh, I want to give credit to all the people on the web who uh, I kindly borrowed some of these photographs from and, and thank them. Uh, you know, this is, we only use this for educational purposes and uh, I'm not sure about copyright and stuff like that. But if anything here is not right, let me know and I'll be more than happy to fix it, especially my facts, because I've noticed as I've gotten older, uh, I don't remember things as much as I used to. <laughs> well, maybe men, maybe I should write this stuff down. Okay, not bad for off the top of my head. I hope you have a good afternoon and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. Obi signing up.